Welcome back, viewers of your award-winning Let's Talk America Radio with host Shayna Thornton. Of course, I am Shayna Thornton. I'm on-air host and executive producer for this innovative program. And welcome to another new episode of Real Talk. It is our live Facebook and YouTube series where we get to speak with the best and the brightest experts and advocates out there about the issues you want to know more about. And tonight's topic is one near and dear to many people's hearts and minds and bodies. I'm talking about pain. How exactly do you address it in the world that we're living in? And it's summer, the temperatures are scorching hot. I am no expert, but I am so excited right now to introduce you to someone. It's his debut uh, appearance on the show, the one and only acclaimed pain specialist, Dr. Joseph Pergolisi. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Anna, and I appreciate all those kind comments. Oh, true. So we've got some tough questions for you to answer about pain. And I know you have a fascinating uh, concept and not really a theory, but saying that uh, scorching temperatures may be related to inflammation and flare ups, things that many people perhaps thought were urban myths. We're going to tackle that and much more. We're not going to be on long tonight, but we are going to ask important questions out there. Okay. Um, but before we get started, we have a pretty neat tradition here on Real Talk Doctor. And that's where we ask our experts the personal side, the human side of what they do. I've seen your CV, your resume. It's quite impressive. But the pain specialist that we're looking at today in 2022, what motivated you out of any area you could have gone into? Why pain management? Help us out. It's a great question. I'll tell you that unfortunately, pain is the number one reason why people seek medical care around the world. And regardless of what specialty you train in, you're going to experience patients with pain. There's eye pain, back pain. There is pain related to your bladder sometimes. You can have dental pain. So unfortunately, pain is omnipresent. And that's why I thought I could make a difference when it came to treating pain. A lot of times people think that pain is just a symptom, but then Patients who have pain for a long period of time, that becomes chronic pain, so it's actually a disease. So I treat both acute and chronic pain. Wow, so that's important. Now, before we dive in a little deeper, um, of course, to you, and I happen to know, of course, the difference between acute and chronic pain, but for in layman's term, for those individuals uh, that may teach or they have other professions, explain the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. Another great question. And people ask this all the time, Shana. So when we look at acute pain, it's something that very much can be related to a causal event. You, you hurt your hand um, because you dropped something heavy on it or you burnt it. And what happens with acute pain is that over time, as that insult goes away, you start to feel better and the pain goes away. With chronic pain, it's some pain that lasts beyond the normal healing period of time. So some people will give a time frame for that, uh, up to about four weeks. So any time from the time of your injury to about four weeks, that's considered acute pain. Then if you look at what's called subacute pain, that's anywhere from about four weeks to 12 weeks. We get really concerned that if a patient comes in with pain after 12 weeks, then we've got some chronic issues going on because your body starts to readjust and actually gets rewired. And that's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, I want to dive deeper into our questioning. Of course, we're not going to be here long, but out of any of the body parts that people have, and, and of course, there are many different parts people can complain about pain. Uh, from your professional experience and practice, and I know you're in Naples, Florida, beautiful Florida, of course, um, what's the most common complaint? Is it back or hip pain, I would imagine? When we look at the most common reason why people are presenting with pain, uh, when it comes to chronic pain, it's usually chronic low back pain. And that can involve nerve involvement or not. Um, we also see a lot of osteoarthritis. Uh, that's a big problem too, your joints. You know, we're very complex biomechanical devices like um, sophisticated cars. And the more you use those joints, um, you're gonna start to get wear and tear on them. Mm 
So I would say that I see um, low back pain and then joint related pain. And we have some fancy terms for that. You know, we call that uh, myalgia when it's your pain, when your pain is related to your muscles. And um, when we start to see the different types of um, chronic pain syndromes, headache is another big thing. People sometimes don't group headache with pain, but it is. And we use a very, you know, funny term for that, cephalogesia, you know, when you have a headache pain. You know, you mentioned wear and tear, and the more you use it, the more it will likely cause you problems. I want to talk about the aging process, right? Uh, many of us are parents or godparents or aunts and uncles, and we can see our nieces and nephews and they're flipping or cartwheels and they're running and they fall and they can tend to bounce back up and, and they may cry a little if they're hurt, but they move forward. Um, we all know that we're not as agile as we age. Uh, most of us over 35 certainly know that up close and personal. Um, does the concept of pain increase um, with age? Is, is that something we can say that more people see pain as they get over 40 or 50? You know, anecdotally, I think most people will believe that. And this has to do with changes in lifestyle and diet and that wear and tear on those joints. It may also have to do with your genetics, unfortunately, but we do see that. And when we start to talk about pain in the elderly, we have to stop for a second and say, well, what's elderly, right? Because, you know, 75 is uh, the new 60. Right. And, <laughs> right. And, and I, I, I pray for that for everyone. But it is something we have to think about as we start to grow older, we don't have the same type of response time too. So it may be that we're more prone to some injuries, uh, particularly if we're overexerting ourselves. I see. Now, I, I want to dive into some questions that many people may be thinking of as we discuss pain uh, right now with the one and only pain specialist, Dr. Joseph uh, Pergolisi. Uh, how does heat intensify someone's pain? I mean, because you're thinking, well, sometimes people say if it's raining or if it's really cold, the pain seems to um, get worse. But does heat, I mean, we've seen heat indexes as high as 110 degrees in Florida and Georgia and South Carolina in the last few weeks. So is that connected to our pain level going up? It's really interesting. I wish that I had super hardcore data to share with you on that, but it's just not out there. But I can tell you this by meeting lots of patients who suffer from pain, they do see differences in the extremes of temperature. Some people will say when it's cold, my joints hurt me more, or if it's very humid. Now, the problem with the scorching temperatures that you were mentioning, and you used a great term, Shana, you said heat index. That's a combination of humidity and high temperature. And that's the real tough one because the heat index actually makes it hotter than the temperature itself. You feel hotter. And so when we look at some common um, types of problems like osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. um, chronic migraines, and then even some more um, uh, common in the pain world, fibromyalgia, or unfortunately in the neurology world, um, um, MS, you see that these patients also are more sensitive to these extreme temperatures, particularly when you mix heat with humidity, that's when we start to see it. Now, could it be that you're dehydrated? Could it be that you're just getting more tired, right? These are all things that do happen. Yeah, I, I want to talk about something as we did dive a little deeper. Um, you mentioned some very serious conditions that are associated with pain. Um, I want to separate right now from those chronic conditions and talk about pain in general. Like you said, there are really bad headaches some people can have or lower back pain um, that may not be, of course, connected to those conditions. But do people have a natural threshold for pain that varies? Like you often hear people say, well, women give birth, so they have a high threshold for pain versus men or males. Uh, is, do you see that some people can generally tolerate pain when you say on a, a scale of one to 10, um, how bad is this pain? Are there some people, I don't wanna say tough as nails, but they probably would be in some pain and they're describing it as fairly low? This is a great question that has been looked at in the literature. And we look at these based on geographical areas that people live in. Um, my background is Italian. And if you 
say that to someone who lives in Germany, they'll say, oh, you guys talk about pain too much. Uh, where in Germany and in Great Britain, where they're considered maybe more stoical and they have less pain. That's um, all sort of uh, a myth in a sense. You know, um, we're all individuals and we're all going to experience pain on an individual level. That's why pain medicine is so exciting for me because no one patient is the same. Unlike let's say high blood pressure, um, I could test your blood pressure and I can give you medications and I can understand why your blood pressure is high or not based on certain types of laboratory values or testing I do. Cholesterol is another example of that. These biomarkers allow us to better understand and generalize to the whole population. But with pain, it's very personal. So your feeling of pain is going to differ than mine. Pain also adds an emotional element. You may hear people say, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. I just feel depressed or I feel down or I'm very anxious. You know, I can't move my back. I'm, I'm afraid to do anything. These type of um, psychosocial elements play into that interpersonal aspect of pain. And that's why for me, it, it's very exciting because Every ex encounter that I have is, is, is fresh and new. It's always got me thinking. But it also makes me realize that that individual really needs, you know, tender, loving care, right? They need you to believe them. They need you to say, yes, you're in pain. And even though I might think, well, you only bumped your, your hip. You shouldn't be in that much pain. You really have to get and work with the patient and understand. And that's why you used another uh, great example, pain scores, right? How often do you hear, what's your pain? Uh, zero or, or 10, 10 being the worst ever. And people will use this type of rating um, to help better understand how uh, severe their pain is. They may also use a temporal scale. They may say, well, I've had it for four weeks or I've had it for 12 weeks. And that's how we can separate um, chronic versus acute. Yeah. So it's very personalized, unfortunately. Uh, and that's so key. I want to ask you something. You talked about blood pressure, or hypertension um, with pain. Often, you know, you'll hear some people will say, well, I'm going to tough it out. I don't need to necessarily see a doctor. I don't want to be on medication. I'm good to go. I am no expert at high blood pressure or hypertension, um, but I'm imagining if you're in really, really bad pain for a long period of time, does that have any impact on blood pressure? I thought you weren't a doctor. That's an excellent connection. That's really great, um, Shannon. And I could tell you this, that at, when you experience more pain, physiologically, your body responds to it. Think about some of the times when you may have been in pain or one of your loved ones has been. Their heart rate goes up. Their blood pressure goes up. They may, if they may not be breathing the way they should, their nutrition goes down, actually can affect your immune system. Um, that's why when I'm addressing a pain person, I, I, I see the whole person. And it really starts with the psychosocial elements, their nutrition. And then we try to treat these individuals um, using a combination of different techniques like multimodal therapy, uh, meaning pharmacological and non-pharmacological. And that's how we, we try to address their pain. But yes, there are physiological indicators like heart rate and not breathing well um, and psychological indicators like feeling down and blue about your pain. Yeah. And I would imagine one thing that probably would not be helpful emotionally as you're trying to cope with pain. And you said this for people to dismiss it, right? Well, you've got a migraine. Oh, my mom had a migraine. It didn't bother her. Or, mm -hmm. you know, often let's talk about childbirthing, right? right. Uh, well, you know, well, I, I gave birth naturally at birth, uh, you know, versus someone who had a C-section and someone could say, well, that's mm -hmm. not the same amount of pain, but it varies from person to person. And you're saying we have to be compassionate about that and not it right. together. Um, and one, let's say this, a doctor, I know you'd agree with me. It's not a competition, right? It, it, <laughs> that's right. That's right. We get no badge, uh, merit badge for having a higher tolerance of pain, but it brings up a good, good subject. You know, there are red flags and yellow flags that you need to think about if you have pain. So let's say you have pain in, in a joint. Mm 
And, and if you see that the pain in that joint is associated with lots of inflammation and swelling and high temperatures, and it's starting to spread throughout your body, you need to go get medical care. Okay. Right. You're 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 going to do a lot of harm to yourself. And, and it does not necessarily have to be a, a pain doctor. Okay. See your regular doctor or see your chiropractor or maybe a nutritionist. But but have someone lay hands on you and discuss it because you don't want to let a red flag or a yellow flag. Example, if someone says I have really bad um, neck pain and all of a sudden now they get neck stiffness. And then all of a sudden their, their arm or their shoulder is not working right. You can connect the dots and see this isn't good. It's starting to get worse. So I agree with you. Yeah. There are many things we can do to treat our acute pain, okay. right? The first thing is ask ourselves, how bad is that pain? How often is it, is it affecting us? What's the impact on our functionality? And we did a survey of pain doctors in the United States, and we found that um, pain doctors for muscle and joint pain are going to go with first line therapy being topical pain relievers. I created one of those called Intiflex. It's a combination of oxygenated oil and menthol. And what we like about pain topical relieving rubs is that you're gonna put it right where the pain hurts, right? And you could use it, you know, usually more frequently than you would something that's oral that you're taking by mouth. Usually you have to wait six or eight hours. Here you could put it on more times and it's affecting the area that has pain. And, you know, we go back to what you brought up at the beginning, the, the heat index. You're right. I watched the news just before and it showed temperatures in the South and Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, Texas, these are all scorching. And the same thing is going on in Europe. So it's really important that uh, the listeners understand there are some things you can do when it comes to uh, addressing pain related to heat. One of those things is to move to shade, right? Get out of the sun, um, you know, go where it's cool. Another idea is to stay hydrated. It, it's very important, and, and I know people don't like to hear this in the summer, you know, limit your alcohol, limit your caffeine. I, I like coffee, I like beer and wine, but in the hot, hot days, you really need to limit it because it can cause increased dehydration. You also need to think about wearing um, breathable clothing and carrying a bottle of water or a portable fan. I saw these really cool little battery-operated portable fans. I, I have to go find one of those. And they're very, very helpful because, again, you want to try to cool yourself down. And the last that I'll tell my patients is that you want to include your pain cream with your sunscreen, okay. right? That's important right? And, and again, that's why I really like Instaflex because it's that oxygenated natural oil with menthol. So those are just some things you can do to get back to that question you had about pain and heat. One last thing I'll mention, we said red flags. Well, if you see that you got overheated and you started to get very crampy and you went into the shade and you did rehydrate yourself, but your fever doesn't go down, and your pain is still there or it's escalating, you need to see a doctor. I see, and that's also key. Uh, you are mm -hmm. watching Real Talk presented by Let's Talk America with host Shana Thornton uh, Radio Podcast. I am Shana, on-air host and executive producer, and we're speaking with the one and only Spain uh, pain specialist based in Naples, Florida, the one and only Dr. Joseph um, Pergo Lick. Pergo Lisi. Pergo Lisi, yeah. Yeah, I got that right. I you're, love that. you're beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate you're that. Welcome, Shana. I, I want to talk about um, you talked about topical um, usage, right? Yes. And you invented one. Very excited to have an inventor on with us as well. Um, as long as well as being a medical doctor. Um, when it comes to the quickness of it, though, when you compare it to traditional painkillers, the pills, uh, which is is more effective? Because I don't need to tell you that many of your pain um, patients complain about the pain and they want it to lead very quickly. That's right. Everybody has uh, no real delayed gratification when it comes to pain. And that's 
a good thing and a bad thing. We have to have certain expectations. If you've really had a tough injury, then you have to know that it's going to take a little time for you to get over this. And, and people get very frustrated and angry about that, particularly when it comes to their muscles and joint pain. I can't use my, my arm like I did ever since I went skiing and hurt my elbow. These are the things we have to realize. So when it comes to acute pain, topical pain relievers applied right to where the muscle or joint um, is, 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 is hurt will allow for a quicker onset of action than something that's taken orally when compared to over-the-counter medications. Now, there are other things too that we need to think about. I'm big on bringing the whole person back in line. So good nutrition you know, certain types of foods, um, certain types of supplements can help you as well. As well. Um, coumarin, a, a, an Indian spice, people like for as an anti-inflammatory. That may be something that's helpful. Others like garlic. They'll tell you, you know, I have a little bit of garlic um, in my food and that can help me with some of my pain. So there are different things you do. Some of my patients who have chronic back pain, I tell them to go to the beach. They love that. Um, and I tell them, take your shoes off and just put your feet in the sand. That's called grounding. And, and my late, um, recently deceased and good friend, Dr. Steve Sinatra, he turned me on to grounding for my patients. And, and you know, you're reconnecting with the earth. So besides the fact that I'm a pain anesthesiologist, right? And we give you medications, we do injections, we, we do all types of really high technical stuff. Um, it's always important to use a combination of pharmacological and non-pharmacological remedies. Yeah. I want to talk about that as we begin to wrap up, because when you talk about pain, it is so common in so many households, people, uh, if it's not them, it's someone they know. Um, but I know no one hears this more than you as a medical doctor. Um, there's been lots of things in the news about some very well-known and famous, uh, very highly prescribed pain meds, right? That um, right. got bad reps and not saying it was all uh, fair. Some of it may have been fair, some unfair. Um, because obviously there are people that are in really bad pain who do need some of those serious pain medications that are out there. Um, but there are people that I say, I, I don't want to be on anything very strong because they don't want to develop a habit for it. Talk overall about the options that are out there. And, and what I happen to know as a health reporter that overwhelmingly majority of people do not get addicted to painkillers, correct? When used properly um, in the way that the physician intended for it to be. You're absolutely right. But it is important that whatever medication or treatment you get, that you have an agreed endpoint. What's your expectation? And the expectation usually is to improve your functionality, right? And that's what we want to focus on, whatever remedies we choose. And when we look at the different type of opportunities, you have manipulation or chiropractic therapy. You have heat. You know, heat um, helps increase circulation at the injured area. It redu reduces natural painkillers in your body. They're called endorphins and enkephalins, and these help reduce the pain. Ice, what does ice do? It can decrease the circulation to that area. It can stop those inflammatory mediators that everyone learned about during COVID, the cytokines and all of those things from building up in that area are oxygen-free radicals. So you can think about ice and heat. You think about um, rest. But, you know, 20 years ago when I started or 25 years ago, someone had back pain. We tell them, go to bed for a couple days. Now we want you up and moving, right? Physical therapy is very helpful. And even if you get over that acute pain, it's not a bad idea to keep that physical therapy for probably another two or three weeks. Okay. Devices. I think one of the biggest areas that we're going to start to see improvements are, are devices, particularly wearables. They're making these little electrical patches that they'll put on that will help people with nerve pain, which is really tough to treat, um, and back pain and other types of things like that. And then a very common pain that unfortunately many of us experience, 70 million people a year have surgery in the United States. So what about post-operative pain, right? right? That's where you want to have that conversation that you just mentioned with your doctor. You want to make sure that you're getting enough post-operative pain medication, but not too much. And if you do get it and you don't use all of it, you want to discard it 
or bring it to um, Operation Medicine Box, which is a drop off um, uh, that uh, different types of um, counties have across the country. We actually started that down here in Naples, Florida with drug free collier. So you can go to your local police station, but you just don't want to leave those medications around and have accessibility to them. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. We need to um, think about all the different options. And again, uh, uh, what I like to think about, too, is, you know, what would your grandma tell you to do? What would your mom tell you to do? You know, all of those old remedies, a lot of them work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, thank you so much for uh, sharing that. And again, I, I want to emphasize what you said. Whatever option someone decides to go with working with their medical provider, you're saying have the end point in sight. So what I hear, doctor, and tell me if I'm wrong, you're saying have that open conversation, an open, honest conversation with your provider about even when the medicines are being prescribed or physical therapy or chiropractic care, you're saying ask what can it achieve and where do you see yourself in six months to a year with this kind of pain, right? Don't necessarily sit there and say, well, you know, that this is what they gave me. I'm not sure why. You're saying be a part of that process. That's right. You want to own it. And you want a two-way conduit of information exchange. And you want to understand, you know, what are the what are the expectations? What are the endpoints? What should I expect to get out of this? And how can I contribute? And the more you know, the better patient you are. And if your your doctor or your your healthcare provider is is not, you know, telling you the answers you want, um, you need to press them. Because, you know, this is not a dress rehearsal. When you get in right. pain, acute pain, right, we want to make sure it doesn't become chronic pain. So we do want to make sure that you're an educated consumer in a sense. And, and that's why it's important to take that right to the healthcare provider and say, ask every time, well, why would we be doing this? Why would we be doing that? What should I expect? And, and what are the side effects that, that I need to know about? It's yeah. way too uh, often that uh, um, patients don't ask those type of questions. And that's why I give you a lot of credit for bringing that up. That's some great advice to your audience. Thank you. And last, before we head out of here, such a great conversation. We're going to have to have you back on, doctor. Um, I'd love to. And people talk about uh, the painkillers, some of the well-known, well-known potent ones that have been in the news that many of us may have been prescribed when they have childbirth from a C-section mm -hmm. to major surgery of any sort. Um, our painkillers, and I'm talking about the oral ones, again, the most popular ones that we know that are potent, were they intended to be long-term or no? That's a great question. You know, if if you look at what's called the gold standard, the randomized double blind, that means the patient and the doctor don't know, placebo, that's a sugar pill, controlled, meaning the that drug versus a placebo, mm -hmm. studies of over 100 people in each arm. Um, we don't see many of those studies, very, very big studies. Half A part of it has to do with um, what is necessary for the compound to get approved as a prescription agent here in the United States. Um, and what should be known is that those studies, uh, though they may not look at the effectiveness, they still are studies that will go on for two or three years that look at the safety. And you would imagine that someone who is in pain would not just be taking a medication for two or three years because it was safe if they didn't get pain relief from it. But you, you again, you hit an, a, an outstanding point. That's why I think you're probably a doctor in disguise. But I'll tell you that um, it is, is critical to understand what you're being prescribed and why you're being prescribed it. And the more potent painkillers, we call them analgesics, um, those are the ones that you need to pay even more attention to. Now, you're right. Sometimes you have severe pain and you're going to need these type of agents. And if you use them, just make sure that your the person who's writing for you understands what the side effect potentials are, which, which could include um, things like addiction, if it is a certain class of drugs, or it could include other things that you mentioned before, like high blood pressure, right, or kidney problems. So these are all things that, you know, a lot of times patients aren't asking, and sometimes they're afraid to. But remember, the more educated you are, the more you own it, the better outcomes you're going to have. And, and one other thing I'll say too, I, I believe also that prayer is a big 
big helpful uh, opportunity too. So, you know, do bond, be a human. Unfortunately, pain dehumanizes people, mm-hmm. right? People start to say, well, what's the matter with that person? They're always in pain mm-hmm. and, and when it comes to chronic pain. So, you know, make sure that you're, you're out there and you're with your loved ones. Uh, they feel your pain too. Yeah, so, so key is the human side of it. Dr. Joseph Pergolisi, such a great conversation we had tonight on Let's Talk America Radio. Great, great information, the human side of it, the compassionate side of it, and some great advice. Of course, tonight's information was general health information for more specific concerns. If you have a condition, of course, please speak with your own medical provider because he or she would know best of what suits you. But what a great educational piece tonight, a great segment with you. Very informative, doctor. Before you leave us, tell our national and international listeners how they can connect with you and learn more about the subject of pain. Well, thank you very much first for the opportunity. Uh, I, I hope I get invited back again because I thoroughly enjoyed this, Shana. And, and, and I really compliment you on your knowledge and the ability to reach out and ask some great questions. People who would like to learn more about myself or even Instaflex um, can look at drpergolisi.com. That's D-R-P-E-R-G-O-L-I-Z-Z-I.com. Or you can go to Healthy Directions. And I'm looking forward to um, being on the show again. Everybody remember, choose the shade over the sun. Don't forget that you want to stay hydrated, stay away from the alcohol and caffeine, uh, and limit it um, in the heat, uh, wear wearable clothes, bring a bottle of water or a portable fan, and don't forget about putting the pain cream on if you have pain with the sunscreen. That's a really good opportunity. So I want to thank you all again, and I look forward to the next time. Love it. Thank you for uh, providing options out there and being fair and having a balanced conversation with us as an acclaimed pain specialist based out of Naples, Florida. Again, the one and only Dr. Joseph Pergolisi. So excited to have him on. We will have you back, I promise. And I don't play a doctor on TV either. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Bye, everybody. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen and kiddos, thanks for watching another edition of Real Talk presented by Let's Talk America Radio. Stay with us for additional information on the program. Visit ltaradio.com. That's ltaradio.com. Or follow the hashtag LTA Radio out there on your favorite social media outlet. We're on the gram, we're on Twitter, and of course, famous Facebook. Connect with us. We want your questions and such a great guest tonight. Keep watching us so we continue to highlight the best and the brightest advocates and experts like Dr. Here tonight and many more topics coming your way. Stay tuned in. Thank you, Dr.